So how often is it that in your daily life, you hear the phrase, you can do it? Throughout your life, you know, whenever you've been trying to do something, whether it's a goal, just an assignment at school, or even a project, this phrase pops up in your vernacular when you're faced with a daunting prospect. You can do it. But that fails to take in context. I'm here not to repeat that general triviality. Instead, you're confronted with a lot of ideas when you have something. You might think it's impractical, that it's not feasible. And then the kicker, someone's already done that before. And these ideas, especially if you have an innovation in mind or something you want to enact, tend to shut that thinking process down. You think you're not going to do that anymore because there's no point. But nothing happens automatically. And that is a double-edged sword because if you have an idea for something, that's not going to come true automatically. You have to work for it, and that's hard. That's understandable. But also, if you want to make a change, whether it's societal, whether it's personal, that's not going to happen automatically either. So the choice is yours to make that happen. That's me almost two years ago when I just turned 15 standing in front of a poster board for a project that I started when I was 14. This entire project started when I was discussing with my mentor, and he was complaining about back pain. Now, how many of you have back pain? Yeah, a lot of you, right? It's a pretty common issue. But in his specific case, it was because he grew up having polio as a child, and so he lost almost all the muscle tissue in his legs. His entire life, he's had to wear leg braces that lock his knee joints so his legs don't collapse when he tries to stand or walk. But normally, when you walk, you have to bend your knee to swing it forward. And when you can't do that, that causes chronic joint and muscle damage when you've been doing that for years. So naturally, like the nerd I am, I thought, hey, if your leg braces aren't good, let's find a better one on the market, right? Because that's what you do. You buy a better one. And that's what the problem is. Like many other devices on the market, the market for leg braces doesn't have better options. They're extremely expensive and don't actually help you walk. And so I thought, let's take some inspiration from Iron Man, shall we? Let's make you a robotic leg if your leg doesn't work. And so that's what I tried to do. This is a video of my mentor walking with his conventional fixed brace. You can see his knee doesn't bend during walking. That's so he can actually put weight on the leg. If it bent, it would collapse. But that causes pain. Now in the next video, the right side of the screen is the bionic leg brace that I created. Here, you can see his left leg bending just like his healthy right leg. That's almost a complete restoration of healthy walking functionality to a completely paralyzed leg. So why am I telling you guys about this story? That's because through this entire process, I learned how to innovate and a few specific tools that I found helped me along the way. If I knew everything that I had to do when I started out, I probably wouldn't have done it at all. But as I found, here are a few specific things that were able to help me achieve this. So the first thing is cultivating skills. And you might ask, you know, don't we cultivate skills all the time? It's not like farming. Skills don't really grow in a field. And even though you cultivate skills all the time when you're at school, these are a few specific things that I found that usually aren't taught. The first one was combining fields. For my project, I had to step way out of my comfort zone and confront fields that I'd never encountered before. Everything from a medical aspect, biomechanics, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science. Yeah, that seems daunting. It was to me, too. But what, to what doing that allows you to do is it lets you take input from different fields and really broaden the horizons of whatever work you're doing. For example, if I locked myself to only a mechanical engineering aspect, I would have left out all of the user input that goes into creating a device that someone's going to have to actually wear in real life. You need a patient's feedback for a device like this. And then, things are inevitably going to go wrong. Not just once, not just twice, many, many times over, sometimes even into the hundreds of times. That's on the right side, when my code had three times as many lines of error output than lines of code I'd written. 
you can almost hear the frustration in my snap there. But oftentimes, it's not even that. Sometimes it's quite more literal. On the left side, have you ever been working on a circuit board and then seen a yellow light flash, and you're like, hmm, I didn't know I had a yellow light on that board. Right, because that wasn't a light, it was a fire. <laughs> See that dark charred spot on the microchip on the left side? Yeah, that, that, that's burned. And then, learning how to troubleshoot all the problems that I faced through this entire process involved, A, figuring out what went wrong by reproducing the issue. That's the burn spot on the chip on the right. Yes, sometimes you have to create more fire in order to figure out exactly how to prevent it. And through this entire process, at some point, you're going to have to ask for help. That was something I had to learn the hard way after I spent hours and hours trying to figure out things on my own until I finally came to the realization that, yes, I actually am quite bad at doing this particular thing. 300 lines of error output in your code is not good. And so there are always experts that you can ask. You just need to find them. Whether it's a mentor you have in your personal life, parents that you can reach out to for emotional support, or even a support forum online where you can give a snippet of code and see who can help you. Look for the resources and know when to ask for help. It's okay. We all need to ask for help sometimes. But all of those were sort of intangible things. What about when you actually need the stuff, the goods? Yes, at some point you're going to need tools and money. That's when I found this. Not having the funding to do something, as I found out, was not the end of the world. Making my prototype would have required thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars that I didn't have. And so in that case, I was actually able to reach out and write a grant proposal to our school district's education foundation. And after a long process of Shark Tank-style boards of investors and having to pitch my idea, I was able to actually get funding from local companies, no strings attached, to do my research. But it's not just applying for grants to get money. The tools are available in your local communities that will allow you to do the things that you want. For example, I needed a 3D print parts. You know, a lot of people have 3D printers at their houses. I'm not one of those people. And so I had to go to my school library and the public library, and there I was able to actually 3D print my parts for little to no cost. The fact that I wasn't able to afford a 3D printer to have at home wasn't preventing me, in the end, from achieving what I wanted to do. And then, of course, sometimes you won't be able to find the really specialized services. I'm talking fancy equipment that can scan a surface and give you the exact curve. And that is when you apply some ingenuity. And in my case, that usually means digging into my toy chest from elementary school, because that's where all the Play-Doh is. So here, I needed to create a CAD design part that would actually attach my mechanism to my mentor's leg brace. I don't have fancy equipment that can scan the plastic and give me the curve. So instead, I used Play-Doh to design the brackets and then went to styrofoam, cut it out with a knife, and then fixed it on there to actually get the dimensions for the part that I needed to create on the computer. And with all of that, sometimes you've got to revert to what I call the engineer's tool belt, duct tape and classically WD-40. What are those two for? Sticking and unsticking, essentially. But they're quite versatile. In my first generation prototype, I needed to have something that could be easily attached and eventually removable, because I knew that wouldn't be my final version. So I attached my brackets with shoelaces and duct tape. It didn't look the prettiest solution, but as it turned out, it was quite practical. The shoelaces and duct tape held it on there quite tight. It could be worn, as my mentor tested and found out. And eventually, I was able to remove it quite easily with the WD-40. When it came time to put the next version on for the next prototype that I was going to make. And speaking of next prototypes, that's the final thing. Improvement is a continual process. Nothing is going to work right the first time, or the second time, or probably even the 47th time. And in my case, that meant making prototype after prototype you can see the giant improvement from the first generation device to the second generation device that I made. And it didn't just involve making something. Through the entire process, whether it's an idea that you want to create a product or even achieving a goal or achieving change, you need to assess exactly how things are going. In my case, that was putting the brace on my mentor, 
testing this walking and seeing quantifiably how much of an improvement there was. And with that, I could figure out exactly how effective my device was being. For things like social platforms, it involves figuring out how much of your user base is being receptive to something. It transcends boundaries, but improvement is continual. And after all of that improvement process, in the end, you go back to the circle of life. Going back to exactly why you're doing it all, and then continuing this process of improvement to better target your audience and have the impact that you want to create. In my case, it was the people that I wanted to have an impact on, the people whose problems I wanted to alleviate, and essentially just people who were important to me and that I wanted to help out. In this case, the device that I created was able to solve the problems that had been plaguing my mentor for years in terms of this non-functional leg brace. But it really transcends that. So when all of you face ideas or challenges that you think you have a potential solution to and that you want to address, here's the challenge for you. Yes, there are going to be problems that you have to tackle along the way. That's inevitable, and that's a fact. But problems are all around us in our everyday life. The choice is yours to look for a solution, to try to tackle it, to try to innovate, to solve, to persevere, to inevitably fail, and to eventually succeed. The choice is yours to try to make an impact. The choice, the choice is yours to try to change the world. So the next time you're faced with one of these prospects, don't ask yourself, can you do it? Just, oh, do it. <laughs> Thank you.